Tonight, the hostage crisis in Haiti. 16 Americans now in danger for their lives. The gang holding the Christian missionaries captive, including a mother and her five children, demanding $17 million in ransom. The FBI and the State Department in country. Tonight, what could happen to those missionaries if the kidnappers' demands aren't met? Also, the miraculous escape. A passenger plane crashing just off the runway, smashing a fence and catching fire. The jet engulfed in flames, the entire fuselage incinerated. Remarkably, all 21 people on board surviving. They were headed to the playoffs in Boston. In politics, President Trump fighting back, suing to keep records about the deadly January 6 riot, hidden, claiming executive privilege. And tonight, Steve Bannon could be facing criminal charges. A congressional committee moving towards holding him in contempt for failing to cooperate with its investigation. Also developing tonight, the FDA set to approve mix and match vaccines, allowing Americans to get a booster dose of a brand different than their initial shots. Dr. John Torres standing by to break down how this will work. In South Carolina, embattled lawyer Alex Murdoch led out of court in shackles, facing fraud and embezzlement charges. Tonight, the tough words from the judge denying him bond. And explosive new revelations from Katie Couric, the former anchor, sitting down to discuss her new book, Going There. Asked about former co-host Matt Lauer, how she treated women she worked with, and if fame and money changed her. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. Tonight on Top Story, we start with that jet crash outside of Houston. A private passenger plane swallowed by flames as it reportedly headed to tonight's Astros baseball game. 21 people on board the charred aircraft. Miraculously, everyone survived. The images of the plane with the fuselage completely incinerated still coming in. Tom Costello covers aviation for us. He starts us off tonight with the miracle on the runway. On a Houston runway this morning, moments of sheer terror. It is a passenger airplane. It happened just after 10 a.m. A private passenger plane fully engulfed in flames at Houston's executive airport as emergency teams quickly converged on the scene. 19 people on board, possibly 21 people on board. There are multiple people off of the plane. Amazingly, everyone escaped. Three crew members and 18 passengers, the youngest a 10-year-old child. Two people suffered minor injuries. They were stunned. They were very, very stunned, but they did all self-extricate. We can't tell you how, how they did that. Authorities say the plane, an MD-87 registered to a local investment firm, was thought to be headed to Boston for tonight's baseball playoff game between the Astros and Red Sox, but the plane never got off the ground. The actual airplane uh, rolled down the run, run, runway, a uh, struck an actual fence, and from there uh, became disabled. The plane involved 34 years old. No U.S. airline still flies the MD-80 series of planes. The cause of today's crash unknown. But what investigators find could be crucial to the few foreign airlines that still fly it. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. And tonight here on Top Story, we're following another breaking story, the hostage crisis unfolding in Haiti. The gang that kidnapped 17 American and Canadian missionaries demanding a $17 million ransom, $1 million for each captive. The FBI and State Department on the ground working with the American embassy in Haiti to negotiate their release. The kidnapping bringing tensions across the country to a boiling point, frustrated Haitians taking to the streets to protest unsafe conditions and the growing gang violence, some burning time Tires and barricading streets. And tonight we're learning more about the Americans trapped there in Haiti. Around them, among them, five children ranging in ages from three to 15. The youngest hostage, just eight months old. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock with the latest on the efforts to bring them all home. An abduction and now details of a mammoth ransom first reported by the Wall Street Journal, citing the Haitian justice minister. $17 million, $1 million per person for the 17 missionaries kidnapped by the notorious 400 Mowozo gang in Haiti. Among those being held captive, a mother and her five children, all but one under 18, according to a friend who did not want to show her face on camera, but goes to the same West Michigan church. They're very genuine. They are loving people. They had a heart for missions. She says the father was also on the trip, but not with them at the time of the abduction. Former FBI Special Agent Tim Gallagher says the agency discourages any payment. 
Ransom payments are, are the fuel that drives these criminal organizations. So the FBI is looking to rescue the individuals, rescue these victims, uh, at the same time depriving this criminal organization uh, of the money that's going to embolden them. The justice minister telling the New York Times, often these gangs know these demands cannot be met and they will consider a counteroffer from the families. We know these groups target U.S. citizens uh, who they assume have the uh, resources and finances to pay ransoms, even if that is not the case. On the ground in Port-au-Prince, conditions are dire. Dr. Margaret Degand, who works at a hospital there, says the violence is inescapable. Every level of the society, even the kids of people that sell things along the streets, okay, they are being kidnapped. So the situation has never been as bad as it is. Ten years ago, Indiana native Rex Beyer was targeted by kidnappers on a missionary trip and was shot in the leg when he tried to escape. We resisted. They, they started shooting. They busted out the windows, and it just, um, just all hell broke loose. If you don't pay a ransom, what happens to the hospital? Oh, very often the people are killed. It's a question of, of life or death. All right, that was our Sam Brock reporting on the situation there in Haiti. We want to go now to Clint Watts. He's a former FBI special agent and NBC News national security analyst for more on this. Clint, I want you to explain to our viewers the role of the FBI down there. Yeah, because it's American citizens abroad, uh, the FBI, through their legal attaches in their international division, takes charge and they essentially get down there and try and get a very good understanding about what's going on in terms of that situation. Normally, they would try and work with local law enforcement or a nation's law enforcement, but recognize this is Haiti and there was a, a, a coup essentially that happened there earlier this year where the president was killed. So when you look at this situation right now, it's almost a lawless era. And that, and that really is what is reflective here, uh, that these missionaries would be kidnapped during a time when the country is under control is probably a lot less likely. And this is really the outcome of it. We, we've seen a lot going on in Haiti in the last six months. You might remember just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about refugees trying to come into the country. So it's a very unstable situation and the FBI is probably trying to get their hands on all the tentacles uh, that wrap around this criminal case. What concerns you most about this Haitian gang called 400 Mawozo? I think there's two aspects to consider. One, usually Americans are not targeted. Uh, even when others are kidnapped in foreign countries, uh, they tend to stay away from Americans because they fear the American government. They fear the FBI, uh, possible military in intervention. And remember, the U.S. military has intervened in Haiti before. The second part, though, is that some others might see this as an opportunity for notoriety, uh, both in terms of terrorism and with criminal gangs. We've seen them undertake kidnappings or large-scale attacks like this as a show of force or a significance, that they are not afraid, and really to raise their street credibility while also garnering very heavy ransoms. That would mean a scaling effect that could be very dangerous for the whole country and for all Americans and Westerners across the board. Finally, Clint, briefly, the ransom is $1 million per person. How does this aid group decide whether to pay or not? And is it their decision or ultimately for our government? There's several parties in these negotiations, usually. Uh, the FBI would be one of them, the U.S. government being, you know, front and center with this. But most of these aid groups uh, oftentimes have hostage kidnapping insurance or work with firms that do this sort of negotiation for them. They're on call and retainer. So it, be it becomes a multi-party negotiation. And oftentimes the negotiators are familiar with the countries like Haiti and the groups that are there. So it'll be a very dynamic situation. And then it'll also come down to... What is the return, essentially, of the American citizens, and does that further incentivize more kidnappings in the future? Clint Watts for us tonight. Clint, we appreciate your analysis. Thank you. We turn now to Capitol Hill in the escalating fight over the January 6th investigation. The House committee said to recommend holding former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon in contempt for not complying with the subpoena. This as former President Trump files a lawsuit of his own to block access to key documents. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig has the latest. Tonight, lawmakers taking a first step towards compelling a former top Trump advisor to tell them what he knew about the planning for the January 6th attack or face potential prosecution. The committee investigating the attack on the Capitol voting later tonight to recommend holding Steve Bannon in contempt of Congress. Why is it important that this committee hears from Steve Bannon? Well, he was in uh, reportedly constant communication with Donald Trump uh, in the days leading up to January 6th. It's also important, though, that the committee affirm the rule of law, that people, when they're subpoenaed, need to show up, 
Uh, and if they don't show up, they need to be prosecuted. Bannon warned of the coming chaos on his podcast the day before the attack. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. It's going to be moving. It's going to be quick. In letters to the committee, Bannon's attorney argued Bannon is legally unable to comply and had been instructed not to provide documents or testimony by Trump. To try to force his hand, the full House would next have to vote to hold Bannon in contempt, recommending the Department of Justice pursue criminal charges, a step President Biden has supported, but would be up to the U.S. Attorney for Washington, D.C. to decide. Meanwhile, the former president has filed a lawsuit of his own, which seeks to prevent the National Archives from turning his White House records over to the committee. The suit calling the investigation an illegal fishing expedition designed to unconstitutionally investigate President Trump. I think the case is a weak one, and uh, we will make our case uh, that uh, really this uh, lawsuit is towards the edge of frivolous. All right, Garrett joins us now from Capitol Hill. Garrett, look, we all know President Trump has always filed lawsuits, even when he was in the private sector. Do we have any insight into the former president's strategy behind filing this lawsuit? Well, the committee members think it's pretty simple. They think he wants to run out the clock on their work. They think his legal argument is weak, but they know the court process can be slow. And they think that the former president's strategy here is to just hope that Republicans take back control of Congress in the midterms, and then a new Republican-controlled Congress dissolves this committee without any of his former aides ever having to testify, Tom. I want to go back to Steve Bannon, and if that vote happens to hold him in contempt of Congress, how many members are we talking here that have to vote, and any sense if Democrats have those votes? Well, look, the committee vote tonight should be unanimous. It's only hand-picked members on this committee uh, with the two Republicans and the, and the Democrats uh, all on the same page. It takes a simple majority vote in the House, likely that 218-vote threshold, uh, for them to send this to the Department of Justice. And then it's really going to be up to, the, to Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, and to the Department of Justice to decide if or how they want to proceed with the prosecution. Garrett Haig for us tonight on Capitol Hill. Garrett, we appreciate your reporting. Now to the other major headline tonight. The FDA reportedly set to approve the mixing and matching of boosters. The decision could come as early as tomorrow, changing the way tens of millions of Americans get that extra dose. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has the latest. As early as tomorrow, the FDA could authorize fully vaccinated Americans to receive a booster shot that's different from the brand they initially received. The approach of mixing and matching COVID vaccines would affect tens of millions of Americans. First reported by the New York Times and confirmed by NBC News, the government will not recommend one shot over the other, saying the public should stick to the vaccine originally received. But for 15 million jabbed with John Johnson & Johnson, new research shows antibody levels rose 76-fold with a Moderna booster compared to a minimal increase with another shot of J&J. &J. What we're finding out is that there are some cases where if you got one vaccine and then are boosted with a different vaccine, you actually get a better immune response, a higher, tighter immune response, a broader immune response against variants. Expected to sign off on Moderna and J&J &J boosters this week, the FDA's decision will then be reviewed and likely approved by the CDC. Amid a pushback on vaccine mandates, authorities are doubling down on their importance, especially for those at higher risk. General Colin Powell, who was fully vaccinated, still lost his life to COVID because he was immunocompromised. Their bodies are just unable uh, to respond to the vaccines. The rest of us need to do all we can to not only protect ourselves, but protect the most vulnerable among us. Tonight, with so many lives on the line, tens of millions are waiting for an extra shot of protection. All right, Miguel joins us right now. And Miguel, the booster debate has caused a lot of confusion. Do you know if the FDA is expected to issue more specific guidelines on what you were just reporting there about the mixing and matching of boosters and who should get the same vaccine? Well, it's still unclear, Tom, and we can certainly be in for a surprise, but we do expect the CDC to issue more guidance at the end of this week, especially if those boosters are approved, as many expect. And the officials are likely going to suggest if you've gotten Pfizer or Moderna to continue with that. The big question here is if you've been inoculated with Johnson & Johnson, should you get another dose of J&J &J or should you get one of those mRNA vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna? Tom? 
Miguel Almaguer for us tonight. Miguel, thank you. There are so many questions about boosters. We're lucky to have Dr. John Torres in-house for us today on Top Story. Dr. John, we thank you for, for being here. My first question to you is, how does this mix and match going to work if you do qualify? And, you know, the biggest important thing here to remember is why they want to do this. And it's for a couple of different reasons. One is for the immunity, to try and bump people's immunities up. Because we're starting to see things wear off a little bit over the months. Doesn't mean it's not protecting you, the vaccine you have. It just means we want it to protect you a little bit better. But the other one, probably more important, is the confusion that might happen if they say there's only one thing you can mix and match with. Instead, it's more than likely they're going to open it up and say, well, regardless of what you got, you can go ahead and get something else. Because you can imagine, especially people that might not be able to get transportation, might not be able to get rides, they go to a place and it's not the vaccine they had before, and all of a sudden they have to try and get another ride. It can be very confusing and hard to get. So it looks like they might just say, you know, let's go ahead and open it up to everything and just get a booster to make sure you're protected. Okay, that's good to know. And also mixing and matching is something that's already happening in other countries, correct? It is. It's happening in a lot of countries around the world, and that's why they're looking at it here using some of that data to say, you know, what are we seeing from them and why are they doing this? And essentially what this comes down to is two thoughts, two fields of thought. One is that, you know, the vaccine we know right now, even though it's dropping off a little bit, is protecting you from serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. By far, it's doing that. But what we're looking at is, can we do it a little better? Can we have it protect you from mild illness and possibly spreading it? And that's what other countries are trying to do. Looks like we're going to try and do that here as well. For the people who don't qualify for a booster, and they're reading all these headlines about boosters, thinking, I I'm not going to be able to get one, what can we tell them about their immunity? The main thing you can tell them about their immunity is that vaccine is still working very well. And what I call the big three, serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. It's protecting you very well against those. And if you look at the percentages, it's less than one one thousandth of a percent that's protecting you from getting it. The, the, those are the people that get it. So hardly anybody gets anything that's fully vaccinated. What it doesn't seem to protect you as well from are those mild illnesses. And, but at the end of the day, as a physician, I tell people, if you're fully vaccinated, you get COVID, you get the sniffles, and you fully recover, that's a win. Do you see a scenario where they approve boosters across the board for all Americans? I do. I do see a scenario coming, and it's going to be inevitable. It's going to happen at some point because we're going to need boosters. We've always known we're going to need boosters. It's just a matter of when. And it's also a matter of this next booster we get, the first booster, how long will it protect us? More than likely, we're going to need one eight-month time period, the first one. The second one might be three, five, or even ten years out. And then after that, it might be periodically every three, five, or ten years. I don't think we're going to be getting them every year because these first boosters are the important ones that prime our immune system, get us that protective phase, and keep that protection going for a long time. NBC News Senior Medical Correspondent Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, thank you. Lots of talk about boosters, but millions of Americans still haven't gotten their first dose. Tensions are at an all-time high with some employers and schools requiring the vaccine. Those who refuse are facing the consequences. Megan Fitzgerald has more. Tonight, the costly toll behind vaccine mandates. Washington State's head football coach fired for refusing to comply with the state's vaccination order, walking away from a $3 million a year contract. And a sudden reversal from Southwest, no longer forcing unvaccinated employees to take unpaid leave. The airline says they're waiting on exemption requests to be reviewed. The news comes after recent airline disruptions, including more than 2,000 Southwest flight cancellations and delays. The mandate battle also hitting the military. Tens of thousands of active duty U.S. service members still unvaccinated ahead of a looming deadline. Despite pushback across the nation, legal experts say private and public businesses can require vaccinations for employment. Employees who were terminated for uh, not complying with mandatory vaccination policy technically are, have been fired for a uh, violation of a company policy. In a lot of states, that can result in disqualification uh, from receiving unemployment benefits. In California, protests over a statewide mandate which requires all K-12 through students get vaccinated, while a school in Miami who stopped vaccinated teachers from interacting with students in the spring now saying vaccinated kids have to stay home for 30 days. The school says they don't believe a vaccinated person can infect another, but says they're erring on the side of caution. Is there any truth to the fact that you can shed the virus? These vaccines do not administer any sort of live virus whatsoever. And across the nation, defiant over the jab at police departments. In Chicago, thousands of police officers risking their job to fight the mayor's mandate. It's about saving lives. It's about maximizing the opportunity to create a safe workplace. 
COVID is the leading cause of death among police officers for the second year in a row, but many officers across the country still holding the line. All right, Megan Fitzgerald joins us now live from Chicago. Megan, you mentioned Southwest there in your story. I'd like to go back to that. They claimed at the time of those delays last week that their vaccine mandate had nothing to do with the delays. Tonight, it seems like Southwest blinked when it came to those employees who did not want to be vaccinated. Yeah, Tom, it certainly appears that way. A change in tone, to be sure. Uh, right now, the airline is saying that they want to work with, they want to coordinate with these employees to try and meet uh, these vaccination mandate requirements. Tom. Megan Fitzgerald for us tonight. Megan, great to have you tonight. Coming up on Top Story, the prominent South Carolina attorney in court accused of stealing millions. The harsh words from the judge denying him freedom. You'll hear it right here. Plus, the FBI raids a mansion linked to a Russian billionaire and a Putin ally. Why they did it. And the breaking news out of California, a mother of three missing since January. Late today, police arresting her husband. We'll have the details. Top Story, just getting started. Back now with another blow to the prominent South Carolina attorney, Alex Murdoch, who stands accused of insurance fraud, denied bond amidst concerns about his drug use and mental state, his finances under a microscope as authorities allege he stole millions. NBC's Katie Beck has more. Tonight, prominent South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch will remain behind bars, denied bond after facing new fraud charges and ordered to receive a psychological evaluation. <laughs> A South Carolina judge ordering Murdoch to remain in custody, questioning the stability of his mental state. Murdoch is accused of stealing more than $3 million from a wrongful death settlement after his longtime housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, suffered a fall at his home in 2018. Money intended for Satterfield's son, they say they never received a dime. The Satterfield's attorney argued against Murdoch's release. Our position is he does not deserve bond. He forfeited that right. He stole. He's a liar and a cheat. Alec Murdoch's lawyers say they appreciated the judge was concerned about his mental health, but that it would delay Murdoch's treatment for his drug addiction. We knew it was going to be um, uh, an uphill battle. There was never an official autopsy done after Satterfield's death, but now investigators are revisiting the case. Meanwhile, investigators are still working to solve the brutal murders of Murdoch's wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, back in June. Murdoch's attorneys have said their client was not involved in the murders, and that he spiraled into an opioid-fueled depression after their deaths, wanting to end his life by allegedly hiring a former client to kill him in a roadside shooting. This so his surviving son could collect a $10 million life insurance payout. That opioid addiction, frankly, put him on the brink of, of losing his life. He attempted to commit suicide at the hand of another. Um, and fortunately for him, his family, and those who love him, that was not successful. Murdoch faced charges for insurance fraud and filing a false police report last month, but was released to a drug rehab facility in Florida. In addition to mounting questions about the killings of his family, more remain about the millions he's accused of stealing. There's so many allegations that he's stolen millions of dollars. Do you have any more clarity on where those millions of dollars have gone or what they were for? We understand he had a drug addiction, but this is millions. Do what we is have clarity? This? Yeah. What yes. is can you, can you shed some no. light on what he was spending no. millions of dollars no. on? No, no. Katie joins us now from Columbia, South Carolina. Katie was there trying to get answers from Murdoch's attorney. And you were asking, where's the money? The question, does he have the money? And if he does, is bond an option? Well, Tom, yeah, I mean, the attorneys didn't really give me a solid answer to that question. But in court today, they were talking about the possibility that Murdoch is trying to dispossess certain assets that he has, one of those things being a boat. Uh, they also said that he gave a power of attorney to his other son, Buster, uh, to kind of manage his finances. So the, the attorneys for the prosecution side were saying they had some concerns about the fact that if they were trying to repay this money, Murdoch may be trying to move things around at this point. They certainly expressed some concerns about that. And in your story there, we saw the judge today denying Murak Bond because of his mental health. Is there a chance she could still get out? 
There definitely is. And the attorneys tell me that by the end of the week, they're going to have that psych evaluation complete. And then they are hopeful that within the next week, they will have another bond hearing before the same judge where that psych evaluation will be reviewed and the judge may or may not reach a different conclusion. I think the defense attorneys were sort of stunned by the outcome today. I think both sides actually thought Murdoch would be walking out the front door. So whether or not this is a final decision will be yet to be seen. We'll have to wait for that psych evaluation to be reevaluated again and then again go before the judge. Tom. Katie Beck for us from Columbia, South Carolina. Coming up on Top Story, we head to the border. Violence there, including thousands of migrants in Mexico clashing with police. These are the images here. They've been held in detention centers for weeks, now vowing to head north. We'll have the latest on tensions boiling over and the role Facebook and WhatsApp could be playing. Plus, the major milestone for Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency making its move to Main Street. We'll explain why investing in it just got very easy and what you need to know. Coming up on our Money Talk segment right here on Top Story. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories news feed, and we begin tonight with the FBI raid on two homes belonging to a Russian billionaire. Federal agents searching the Washington, D.C. and New York residences of Oleg Deripaska, the oligarch, a known associate of Russian President Vladimir Putin and former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort. The Trump administration sanctioned Deripaska for 2016 election interference. Authorities say the raid is related to a federal investigation right here in New York. A Republican congressman has been charged with lying to the FBI. Nebraska Representative Jeff Fortenberry allegedly took money from a Lebanese Nigerian businessman during his 2016 campaign and is now accused of lying to the FBI about the donations in 2019. A grand jury indicting the congressman on one count of falsifying facts and two counts of lying to federal investigators. Fortenberry has claimed his innocence, saying he plans, plans to fight the charges. A California man has been arrested in the murder of his wife. Law enforcement raiding the Chula Vista, California home of Larry Millet, taking him into custody late today. His wife, Maya, was last seen alive in January. Her disappearance gripping the small town, neighbors and friends searching for the mother of three for months. Millet was first named a person of interest back in July and has maintained he had nothing to do with his wife's disappearance. A $25 million settlement has been reached with the families affected by the Parkland shooting. The Broward County School District agreeing to pay the families of 52 victims. The loved ones of the 17 killed in the attack expected to receive the largest amount. The news comes just one day before Nicholas Cruz, the suspect in that shooting, is expected to plead guilty in that case. All right, we want to turn now to Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. Bitcoin has more than doubled in price this year, and it's now becoming more mainstream as everyday investors can now invest in a fund that tracks its price. It's a major milestone for the cryptocurrency. This ETF fund is the first of its kind on the U.S. stock exchange for Bitcoin. CNBC tech reporter Mackenzie Segalos joins us now. Mackenzie, you know, put this in a context for us. What does this ETF mean for Bitcoin? Tom, this is a game changer for Bitcoin adoption. There's a potential here for an ETF frenzy, and that's absolutely huge for the crypto industry because it makes Bitcoin accessible to most investors with a brokerage account. It also legitimizes the crypto asset class as a whole, and already we're seeing the price of Bitcoin trading near its all-time high, and some analysts say it could rise a lot more in the weeks ahead. Do we know who's behind this ETF? So today's Bitcoin ETF debut was from ProShares, but there are several other providers that may soon follow suit. Invesco and Galaxy Digital are on that list, and all this competition is a good thing for investors. It means there are more names to compete on fees. One thing to keep in mind, though, uh, this isn't the same thing as investing in Bitcoin directly. Instead, these ETFs track Bitcoin futures contracts, which speculate on the future price of the coin. Yeah, which uh, has been going up and down for the past year, as we've seen. This is, though, a major step forward for crypto. Do you think it'll stay largely unregulated? No, I don't. And SEC chair Gary Gensler actually made the point today on CNBC that Bitcoin futures, which is what we're talking about here, have been regulated for four years. The infrastructure bill contains new reporting requirements for cryptocurrency brokers, and the industry wants regulators to set some ground rules. Prominent players in the space, including Coinbase and Andreessen Horowitz, have asked regulators for more clarity. 
All right, Mackenzie, we thank you for that so much. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, we begin with a major policy shift in the Middle East. Israel announcing it will approve registrations for 4,000 undocumented Palestinians living in the West Bank. The move ending a 10-year freeze, allowing those residents to apply for government IDs that let them pass through military checkpoints. Authorities in Mexico City are bringing criminal charges in relation to a deadly subway derailment. You may remember this. 26 people were killed and dozens more injured when an overpass collapsed in May, bringing elevated subway cars crashing to the ground. Prosecutors charging 10 companies and individuals with negligent homicide, alleging construction and design defects caused the catastrophic accident. A preliminary hearing is set for next week. On a stunning discovery in the Mediterranean Sea, a scuba diver finding a 900-year-old sword off the coast of Israel. Experts believe the artifact comes from the time of the Crusades. The three-foot weapon was found about 500 feet from the coastline amid a trove of ancient pottery pieces and anchors. The sword will be put on public display after it's cleaned and analyzed. Now we turn to the Americas and look at the stories coming out of the U.S. and across Latin America. Tonight we take you to the border between Mexico and Guatemala, where tensions are running high as thousands of migrants prepare to join another caravan scheduled for later this month. NBC News correspondent Julia Ainsley on what the Biden administration is doing to monitor groups of migrants headed north. Desperation boiling over in southern Mexico. Violent clashes between Mexican officers and migrants who have been held at the Mexico-Guatemala border. Many of them have been waiting there for weeks, even months, but now preparing to once again continue their journey north. The Mexican government saying those who attempt to leave the city will be met with legal punishments. Some migrants taking that as a threat. The clash is foreshadowing further tensions across Latin America as tens of thousands are on their journey north. In Mexico, officials have reported over 140,000 migrants in the country in the first eight months of 2021. That's three times the number seen last year. <laughs> Over the weekend, migrants from countries all across Latin America held a vigil in Tapachula, Mexico. There are thousands there praying for a safe journey as they prepare to join the next caravan set to leave on October 23rd. Selena is a Honduran migrant. She has faith that she will make it to the United States. But they're not just looking for divine intervention. They're also trying the Mexican legal system. Almost 2,000 migrants asked for social aid in Mexico so they wouldn't be detained or deported. The organization Pueblo Sin Fronteras says the caravan will be massive. Tenemos más de 2,000 personas que han aplicado que quieren ser parte de este contingente, que quieren salir de la ciudad. Y si hay 2,000, quiere decir que tenemos 6,000 personas. But the Biden administration does not want to be caught off guard. NBC News obtained government plans to build an intelligence cell that would monitor and predict migrant movements towards the U.S., just like the nearly 30,000 that arrived in Del Rio, Texas, last month. One of the main tasks is to focus on misinformation and social media that is pushing many to take the dangerous journey. A senior DHS official telling NBC that once they arrive in Mexico, it's too late to intervene. But for those who are already in Mexico, they're getting desperate. Despite the dangers, many still risking it all to reach their final destination, the United States. Julia joins us now from Washington. And Julia, you mentioned the Biden administration is targeting social media disinformation. What kind of messages are we talking about here? And a lot of times you were telling me this comes from the smugglers directly. That's right. They're trying to make a profit here by advertising sometimes on Facebook, other times on WhatsApp or other social media platforms where they tell would-be immigrants, now is the time to come. Come today. Come during this week. This is the time if you come to the United States, you'll be able to stay. If you come after that, you won't. It incentivizes migrants to make a very quick decision, spend a lot of money, and oftentimes, Tom, they're met with quick deportation or expulsion because simply the messages that these cartels and smugglers are spreading about the Biden 
administration's policies are not correct. And Julie, do we know what exactly the Biden administration can do to sort of combat that misinformation on places like Facebook and WhatsApp? Well, they're trying to run their own media campaigns in those countries, whether those be on billboards or radio stations, also just going straight to the source, trying to get their own information out on Facebook. They're actually bringing analysts into an intelligence gathering cell now who can build algorithms to look at the most popular, fastest spreading disinformation campaigns so that they can get to those the fastest and keep immigrants from leaving their home countries or the countries where they are now before it's too late. All right, we thank you for that. Coming up, the controversy surrounding concussions and the NFL, the league coming under fire for a practice known as race norming, which it uses to diagnose brain injuries. Some medical experts calling it the practice outdated and oversimplified. A court deadline today could bring major changes. Stay with us. Back now on Top Story, we turn to the NFL, which faced a court deadline today. It's working to end a practice that uses race to determine how much money former players receive from the $1 billion concussion settlement fund. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the story on this controversial process. It was an historic settlement. Four years ago, the NFL agreeing to pay nearly $1 billion to former players suffering the long-term effects of concussions. Former defensive lineman Amon Gordon was diagnosed with dementia when he was 33. It's kind of went numb, you know. At the time, we had a three-year-old son, and I'm thinking, my gosh, is he going to even be around for him when he grows up? Last summer, Gordon and his wife Roxy learned the protocols to qualify for the settlement included something called race norming. To this day, have you received a penny from this settlement? We haven't received a penny from the NFL. You think it's because... He's black. I absolutely think it because he's black. I think he's been discriminated against, and his case is just extremely egregious, and it's just, it's horrible. Players' cognitive test scores were adjusted based on age, education, and controversially, race. Race norms were first developed as a Band-Aid solution because blacks in this country, on average, have experienced much more social disadvantage than whites. Some medical professionals called the process outdated and oversimplified. It's imprecise, it's bad medicine, and it perpetuates false ideas about differences in intelligence by the color of skin. But it became part of the protocol used in the NFL settlement and effectively meant black players had to score more poorly than white players on cognition tests. The claims process was approved by a judge after the league and the players legal team reached an agreement. But many of the players say they knew nothing about the race norming, including Amon Gordon. He played in the NFL for eight years, retiring in 2012. Do you have any sense of how many concussions you may have gotten over that period of time? I have no idea. I mean, innumerable amounts. Now he suffers from headaches, anxiety, and panic attacks. It's like imagine your brain being frozen until about noon. If we're lucky. Some, Some days, days are, better than, others, are better than others. Some days noon still doesn't feel normal. At first, they were told Amon qualified to receive part of the settlement, only to have the league appeal the decision. A judge agreed with the NFL, deciding an error was made, but the couple were never told what it was. In the summer of 2020, the Gordons joined tens of thousands of others calling for an end to the race norming. There was a different door for African Americans and a different door for white players. Brain damage is brain damage. In June of this year, the NFL, together with attorneys for the players, announced they would come up with new protocols. The league has denied that the system was discriminatory, but in a statement at the time wrote, everyone agrees race-based norms should be replaced, but no off-the-shelf alternative exists. And that's why these experts are working to solve this decades-old issue. Adding the process would be retroactive for players affected by race norming. Their agreed-upon proposal is due tomorrow in court. For Amon Gordon and potentially hundreds of others like him, it could mean their cases will be reconsidered. I'm hoping that the NFL will take a look at these people and their families and do what's right. It's time. For a league hoping to improve its image on issues of race, the Gordons say how the NFL handles changes in this settlement will be the true test. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, San Diego. Coming up on Top Story, Katie Couric unplugged. The former anchor talks about Matt Lauer and how she felt she had to protect her turf against other women. Stay with us.
We turn tonight to former Today Show anchor Katie Couric and her upcoming memoir, Going There. Couric joining the Today Show for multiple interviews ahead of the book's release. She discussed Matt Lauer, her longtime co-host, who was fired in 2017 amid sexual harassment allegations, her controversial interview with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and her decision not to mentor some women in the news industry. Well, let's talk about your time here at Today Show. You were here 15 years. Yeah. Nine of them, your partner was Matt Lauer. You talk about the book wrestling with, trying to come to terms with the accusations against him. What did you ultimately conclude? Um, you know, that was really, really hard. And it took me a long time to process what was going on because the side of Matt I knew was the side of Matt I think you all knew. He was kind and generous and considerate, uh, a good colleague. And, you know, as I got more information and learned what was going on behind the scenes, it was really upsetting and disturbing. And I think I, and, and then I did some of my own reporting. I talked to people. I really tried to esca excavate what had been going on. And, you know, it was, it was really devastating, but also disgusting. And, uh, you know, I think what I realized is there was a side of Matt I never really knew. And I tried to understand why he behaved the way he did and why he was so reckless and callous and honestly abusive to other women. Were there things that you, in the course of writing this book, you looked back on stories or memories that you came to see in a different light? Well, you know, there's always gossip in television news, and I think there was gossip here and there about certain people. And, you know, I think it was a very permissive environment in the 90s, and I think permissive environments often result in, in serious transgressions. And, uh, you know, I think back then it was sort of like you felt like it was none of your business and nobody ever came to me to talk to me about it. And I think our notion of what a consensual relationship has changed dramatically and you have to consider the power dynamics. I'm sure you've learned a lot about this, too. You talked about um, after his firing, um, whether to grappling with whether to continue that friendship and you even include your actual text messages that you had. With yeah, Matt. you kept them. Where does that relationship stand now? We have no relationship. You know, I think I use those text messages because I thought they were very illustrative of how our relationship devolved and ultimately deteriorated. Um, so, so I thought that was a powerful way to kind of really let the reader in to my thought process. And as I got more and more information, how it was harder and harder for me to reconcile these two sides. Couric later addressing the controversy surrounding her interview with the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Talking about journalism, and this is very much a journalism story, you did make an eye-opening revelation about an interview you did with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You decided to leave out newsworthy comments that she made on the subject of kneeling during the national anthem. Yeah. How did you justify that? It, it violates a cardinal rule of journalism. To well, do that. I think I think what people don't realize is we make editorial decisions like that all the time. And I chose to talk about this and put it in the book for a discussion. Um, I mentioned that I, it was a conundrum that I asked Justice Ginsburg about Colin Kaepernick and taking a knee and how she felt about that. And I did include the fact that she said it was dumb and disrespectful, it was stupid and arrogant, and quite a bit of what she said. There was another line that I thought was, I wasn't sure what she meant exactly, and I thought it was subject to interpretation. What I wish I had done is asked a follow-up to clarify, or just run it and let her clarify it later. But I think the, the, the most pertinent and direct response to the question about Colin Kaepernick, I included. And that's why I raised it, because maybe I should have done the other sentence as well. Let me push you on it a little bit, because um, she did make those comments. You said in the book that you wanted to protect her. 
Yeah. So that's not an occasion where you're using that objectivity that's so important to us journalists. And, yeah. and the question is whether that undermines journalism at a time when reporters are under attack for bias like you know, that. You know, I think Justice Brandeis says sunshine is the best disinfectant. And I think the more we can be transparent about the decisions we make and the more we can say maybe that wasn't the right one, do you think the it better was off wrong we were. now that you look at it in the yeah, light of day? Yeah, I think I ultimately I think I should have included it, but I also think it's really important to look at what I did include. She had to make a statement afterwards saying her comments were harsh and dismissive. I think uh, I still believe I used the most critically important response, but I think you're right. It might have uh, illuminated even it even more if I had included that other statement. Couric also opening up about her experience at the Today Show and feeling she needed to protect her high-profile job at the expense of others. You talked openly about female mentorship. You said you were you had your own insecurities. Mm -hmm. You know, you felt like you had to protect your turf. Those were your words. Yeah. Are you, I mean, do you regret that now? I mean, what's your perspective on it now? You yeah. said, um, I was less welcoming when charismatic female correspondents entered my sphere. There were only a few coveted spots for women. I felt like I had to protect my turf. Yeah, I mean, I think that's brutally honest, mm -hmm. you know? I think that I have mentored scores of women uh, many of who still work on this show and in the control room. Hi, ladies. But, um, you know, I think that when there are very few jobs for women and men are making decisions not necessarily based on, you know, the right criteria, that sometimes you do get insecure and sometimes you do get territorial. I think it's human nature. I think anyone in a high profile position uh, in a coveted spot, and I think even outside the TV industry, both women and men have felt that occasionally. I just was honest enough to admit it, I think. To, and to be clear, did you ever actively try to sabotage never, another female on-air correspondent? Never, never, I think I just wish that maybe I had extended myself more and shown people the rope, but ropes a little bit more, but I think when people are outwardly kind of vying for your job, it, it is hard to be generous, I think. Katie also addressing her eventual move from NBC and the Today Show to CBS, becoming the first woman to solo anchor a network evening news broadcast and all the changes that came with that role. When you're reading the book, you realize why you were so successful. It is so funny, so relatable in the beginning. You're so self-deprecating. But then you also sort of notice a change. And I think it, it sort of happens when you decide to leave the Today Show. And so when I was reading this, I wanted to ask you, do you think you changed? Do you, do you think the person that became so su successful in the Today Show became a different person when I you decided to leave? I don't really. I mean, I think I wanted to try something new and have a new challenge. Um, I loved my years on the Today Show. It's such a great job and it's so much fun and the people are so wonderful. But no, I don't really think I changed at all. I the think fame I, and the money, it, it didn't, you don't think it changed you? No, I don't think so. I really don't. I'm essentially the same person who, I am, who I've always been. You know, I think it's hard because, you know, you get all these forces and, you know, you feel like, gosh, this is this is a lot to handle. And I think there were times when probably the hubris got to me. I right. think it gets to everybody and you have to kind of level set. But I think I've always had my my priority straight. And I think that when my husband died and my sister died, I realized very quickly what really matters is, mm -hmm. you know, your family and the people who are closest to you. Mm -hmm. so um, but I think the problem is probably I didn't change enough when I went to CBS. I was more of a product of the Today Show and NBC, mm -hmm. and I think it was a real culture clash. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think people internally really accepted me, and I thought we were much further along when it came to sexism. Uh, because I enjoyed such a great position at the Today Show, I thought America was really ready mm. for a female anchor of the evening news, and I think we were just not as far along as I naively thought, I think. You mean the folks at CBS? Bo both internally, mm -hmm. but also externally. Um, you know, I'm not sure if the country was ready for a female anchor, maybe they weren't just ready for me as a female mm -hmm. anchor because of their perceptions of me. But I really went there to say a woman can do this job with right. confidence and competence. And that's really what, what motivated my decision, not because, oh, I'm, you know, I mean, I was doing great here. 
Katie Couric's book, Going There, comes out October 26th. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. I'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.